Welcome back to the Russell's Mill Schoolhouse. This is the presentation for the 26th of February, 2017. It's part of our Sunday afternoon series. And this afternoon we have back for, for another visit, our good friend Richard Gifford from Little Compton, Rhode Island, who will be talking about Paul Cuffey, friends and family. He's done a great deal of research. We have great respect for his research. And he knows how to get take some terrific slides of places you'll recognize if you pay close attention. I'm very grateful to Richard for helping us out. He's been a faithful friend to the society. And we welcome, again to, welcome him again today. And I'll turn it over now to Richard Gifford. Thank you, Bob. I'm here to talk about um, the friends and family of Paul Cuffey, who is probably Westport's most celebrated uh, citizen. And this September, uh, a committee uh, of which Bob and I are both members are putting together a symposium to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the death of Paul Cuffey. Um, Paul Cuffey is special for any number of reasons. Uh, a couple of which I'll, I'll briefly mention. He was a, a born to an ex-slave father and an Indian mother. And he uh, submitted several petitions in the 1780s that were important uh, in obtaining a, a, a milestone in Massachusetts law, which is the granting of the right to vote to people of color. Uh, Cuffey said that uh, reason that if he wasn't, if he had to pay taxes, he should have the right to vote. Uh, and eventually those, uh, those complaints that he had uh, fell on supportive ears. Massachusetts was the first state to give people of color the, uh, the right to vote. Cuffey went on to found really a, a family empire, a commercial empire. Uh, really the first family of color anywhere in the United States to do so. Uh, he was involved in various uh, shipping interest, uh, boat building, uh, and a variety of commercial enterprises and whaling, and which was carried on by his, uh, not only his sons, but his nephews, uh, and, and survived quite a few years after uh, Cuffey's death. We'll start with the, uh, the first slide, which is the, this is called the Howard Cemetery or the Howard uh, Cuffey Cemetery. This is at the corner of Fisher and Old Westport Roads, uh, right on the Westport-Dartmouth line. The cemetery itself, I'm told, is just over the line in Dartmouth. This cemetery was located at the far northeast corner of the Cuffey Slocum farm, which was a 120-acre farm that Cuffey Slocum, who was Paul Cuffey's father, purchased in 1765. Uh, prior to that time, or I should say until the, from his arrival in the, uh, the colonies from Africa, uh, he had been uh, a slave of two members of the uh, Slocum family, Ebenezer Slocum and then John Slocum. And they lived down town towards uh, Barney's Joy. And John Slocum freed Cuffey Slocum sometime in the 1740s. After that, Cuffey Slocum went to work for yet another Slocum, Holder Slocum, uh, and as part of that work, he was, uh, Holder Slocum had a vast uh, real estate uh, holdings all over. Dartmouth, he owned, in addition, he owned Cuddy Hunk, Nashon, uh, uh, Penikees, and half of Nashawina. He had land in Newport. But Cuffey Slocum's assignment, as it were, was to be a caretaker on Cuddy Hunk, which he did. Uh, throughout the 1750s until such time as he bought his uh, property here uh, 
1765. What did he do on Cutty Hunk? It's a pretty fair uh, inference that he took care of sheep. That's basically what the Slocums did. They kept sheep in the wintertime on the mainland, and then in the springtime they would put the sheep on ships and they would go out to the islands. They were the first uh, summer residents out on those islands. And uh, they would spend the summer there. Accounts from the islands from the late 1700s, early 1800s, tell us that the islands were almost denuded of, of uh, vegetation. The ship, sheep were uh, uh, voracious uh, eaters. And so, but as of 1765, Cuff, Cuffy Slocum becomes uh, a farmer. And he, he purchases uh, this farm. Now, where did he get the name Cuffy from? Cuffy is an anglicized version of an African word, an Ashanti word in particular, Kofi. Uh, and that means born on Friday. Uh, in the Ashanti custom, the male children were given the, the name of the day of the week in which they were born. And the Ashanti lived in what is now uh, Ghana. And if the name uh, Kofi may sound vaguely familiar, remember that Kofi Annan, who was the former Secretary General of the United Nations, if you look at his history, you will find that he was from Ghana, that he is a member of the Ashanti tribe, and he, too, was born on a Friday. Um, there are other names, by the way, in, on the subject of, of kind of when you're going through records and kind of looking for people who might have been ex-slaves, quite a few uh, Ashanti uh, names do show up. And it's not just uh, Cuffey Slocum. You also have a Cuffey Freeborn who lived in Dartmouth. And you had a Cuffey Lawton in New Bedford. Uh, Piro is another Ashanti name for a different day of the week. And uh, we have uh, Piro Russell, who was here in Dartmouth. And in addition in Dartmouth, you had a Piro Howland, Piro Cogshall, Piro Brayton, uh, and in Tiverton, a Piro Almy. Another name you come up from the old slave, Ashanti slave names is Quash. And in Dartmouth, you had a Quash Anthony and Quash West. In Tiverton, you had a Quash Almy. Cujo is another name, and in Tiverton you have Cujo Cook, in Dartmouth Cujo Kennedy, in the old vital records. In Little Compton uh, you had Quaco Bailey, which is another Ashanti uh, day name. Uh, sometimes you also see ex-slaves given the names of cities by their, their masters, and so for example, we, uh, Paul Cuffey had a brother-in-law named Boston Durfee. In Westport, we had uh, Newport Gardner, London Richmond, Glasgow Corey, and Bristol Hall, Windsor Anthony, and Exeter uh, Dick. And a third category of slave names that you'll come across sometimes in the vital records are names taken from Roman history. And in Westport, you had uh, Jupiter Corey, who was a slave of uh, Isaac Corey down at the uh, Westport Point. In Dartmouth, you have Caesar Slocum, Caesar Potter, Caesar Russell, Pompey Peckham, and Augustus Peck. Uh, in Little Compton, you had Nero Gray. And in Tiverton, you have uh, Cato uh, Brightman. Next. Uh, this is another, this shows the marker uh, stone uh, for that cemetery. Um, out to the left, that's Old Westport Road there. Uh, there's about 30 stones in this cemetery. None of them um, are marked. Uh, identifying the individuals buried here is, is very hard. But in all likelihood, Cuffy Slocum and his wife are buried here. One person we know is buried here is Naomi Howard, who was Paul Cuffy's daughter. Uh, there was some controversy when she was buried here. She died very young. It was about 1812. And uh, her husband, Peter Howard, who lived over in New Bedford, had a carved gravestone that he wanted to put in the cemetery. And John Cuffy, who was Paul's brother, 
wrote uh, a letter in which he said basically that over his dead body would a carved gravestone be placed in his cemetery. At the time, John owned uh, uh, this part of the farm. After uh, Cuff Slocum died, the western part of the farm, which had the house, was given to Paul Cuffey, and John uh, received the eastern part, which included the cemetery. John's, uh, John's family lived here until about 1860. Paul's half, uh, Paul gave it to his son, Paul Jr., who didn't manage to hang on to it very long. It was uh, really almost like a foreclosure action that he, um, that he lost the farm uh, back in the uh, 1820s. Next. <clears throat> this is the, uh, <clears throat> the Handy House <clears throat> at the corner of Hicksbridge and Drift Road in Westport. Uh, that's Eric Radoya, who's an architectural historian who gave a lecture a couple of years ago. Uh, built by William White about 1712. The reason I'm showing this photograph, this was uh, in the uh, late 1700s to about 1860 was the uh, place where doctors Eli and James Handy, father and son, uh, practiced. Dr. Handy, uh, the, the Handy records are in the possession of the Westport Historical Society. They treated many, many people of color uh, from this area, including Paul Cuffey and many members of his uh, extended family. Um, of course, whenever you, Dr. especially Dr. James Handy's name comes up, uh, I can't let it go by without recounting the, the old saw that uh, Dr. Handy in his entire career never sent a bill to a single patient, and he never paid a single bill that was sent to him. And uh, there's, there's some truth in, in, in both statements. Usually, Dr. Handy's records show that he worked out a lot of um, bills to patients by having uh, accounts. People really didn't pay cash very much in those days, say 1800 to 1820. They're often uh, bringing uh, Dr. Handy, for example, they'd be bringing him uh, everything. Uh, coffee, I think, brought boards and nails one time. People might bring chickens or eggs or whatever and to get a credit uh, on their account. This is the uh, Westport poor farm or the almshouse uh, on Drift Road. Um, this is looking up towards the road. The road is behind uh, the house. Uh, Paul Cuffey had a daughter. I, I, I mentioned about the success of, the commercial success of, of a lot of people in the Cuffey family. They didn't all have a great deal of, of success. And one example was his daughter Rhoda, who uh, spent her uh, final years as a, uh, a resident of the, uh, uh, the poor farm. In those days, people who, and the poor farm tended to be, if you look at the records of poor farm, it's probably the same thing for Dartmouth. It tends to be elderly people, disabled people, or very young orphans, and it's basically three categories. And Rhoda Cuffey would have fit into the, uh, uh, the first category by the time uh, she was here. Also, Rodney Wainer, who was a, uh, a nephew of um, Paul Cuffey, was here about the same time. Rhoda would have been here. I think she died in 1858 or so, so she would have been here uh, about that time. This is the um, William Kirby house. This is on Drift Road in Westport. Um, this was built by uh, William K uh, Kirby about 1785. He was uh, the brother of my uh, great, great, great grandfather, Abraham Kirby. Kirby was the neighbor of Paul Cuffey, one of Paul Cuffey's Drift Road properties is a 40-acre, what's called the Allen Lot, which is just to the south of his property. And there's a lot of correspondence between Cuffey and the uh, viewers of fences for Westport, uh, in which Cuffey complains that the stone walls are not being maintained by Kirby uh, 
Uh, and the reason that that's uh, presumably the reason that Coffey objected to that was that Kirby's animals were, were straying over uh, onto his property and causing damage to whatever crops he had growing there. Uh, the Westport in those days, they had 14 uh, viewers of fences who served in office simultaneously, which is five more than the U.S. Supreme Court had now or then. But uh, they didn't have some of the difficult issues to face that the uh, viewers of fences had. They eventually resolved it somewhat Solomon-like by saying that, well, Kirby should uh, take the, uh, the, the stone wall is basically bisected by drift road. You know, it's, it's a, Kirby can take the uh, inland part and the part down to the river can be uh, maintained by, uh, by Cuffey. This is, house is in Adamsville, Main Street in Adamsville. Um, this was the house of Captain uh, Sylvester Gifford. Uh, he was a white uh, uh, sea captain who, and one of the few white sea captains who were entrusted with commanding uh, ships owned by the uh, Cuffey and Wainer families. In this case, uh, Gifford commanded the Traveler, which was probably Paul Cuffey's uh, most famous ship, on a voyage to uh, Lisbon, uh, Portugal, in 1810. Uh, Benjamin Seabury is another little Compton, white little Compton sea captain who, uh, who, worked, uh, who worked for the Cuffeys. Next. This is down, <clears throat> down at Westport Point. This is the house of uh, Thomas White Mayhew, who um, was another <clears throat> ship captain, although he didn't work for Cuffey, but as a, in, in the 1860s, he wrote uh, a, a newspaper article for the New Bedford Mercury. <clears throat> the, you're talking, you know, 50 years after Cuffey's death. He... Uh, it, he made a, a, a reminiscence, if you will, uh, of meetings that his his father <clears throat> his father had with uh, with Cuffey, and uh, with one of the better portrayals and and more detailed portrayals of Cuffey uh, that you'll find um, from that era. His father was Captain Hilliard Mayhew, who supposedly was the first the person who built the original uh, version of Lee's Wharf at, uh, at Westport Point. This is the <clears throat> Isaac Corey house, also Westport Point. Uh, Corey was uh, an important, anybody who was involved in shipping got a ship out of Westport you needed uh, to have a relationship with a guy like Corey. Uh, Corey, and he was a founder of his own kind of commercial dynasty at Westport Point, um, Isaac Corey and Sons, which lasted, I think, about over 100 years, I think, the very, about three or four generations of Corey's carried it on. They did everything from uh, provisioning ships to arranging for cargoes, to uh, getting rid of, selling cargoes once they had uh, arrived. If you're a guy like uh, Coffey, um, I mean, there's, there's various ways to be, if you will, a, 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 uh, a carrier. And today, the way most freight would be transported is that a manufacturer or provider would, would engage a service to transport commodities from point A to point B, whether it be by truck, by airplane, by ship. Uh, in those days, shipping tended to be coffee, who, who, or the people who would own the ship, would buy the cargo. They would bring it to point B. They would sell the cargo. On his own account, he would buy another cargo and either return to point A or go to point C, go to some port where he thought he could unload that cargo. The, the carrier uh, 
the person who owns the ship doesn't make any money by uh, keeping his ship uh, in port and while he still has to pay his crew. So the idea is to sail as full as possible uh, and sail as, as, as often as possible and not sit around. And so a lot of times if the market wasn't good for a commodity, you know, if Cuffey came back to Westport, say, and he wanted to turn around and take another cargo, he didn't just want to wait around until he could uh, unload the cargo. He'd engage the services of someone like Corey. They would warehouse it. Corey would, would act almost like a broker to find, uh, find buyers. Cuffey had one famous uh, um, uh, shipment of cam wood, which, which he brought from Africa on one of his voyages to Sierra Leone. And it took him years to get rid of the stuff. And he, he, they had it here, they had it there. He actually, a, I think a guy in Poughkeepsie, New York, ended up uh, buying it, who was a Howland, who originated from around here. But uh, that, it, it took years to unload that, uh, that cam wood. And Cuffey never, uh, never, brought, uh, never brought that over again. Uh, another, I mentioned sea captains, white sea captains who worked for Cuffey. Another one was Captain Aza Bly, who was uh, Isaac Corey's son-in-law. He was in command of the Ranger. Uh, another son-in-law of Corey was George Washington Davis, who was partner of Cuffey in the operation of a windmill at... Uh, at Westport Point, there was a windmill. It's up by, uh, if you know where Hotel Hill is on um, Westport Point, it's, it, the windmill was up in that area. Um, don't know what happened to it, no longer in existence. This is the um, so-called Betty Alden House, on West Main Road, Little Compton. Uh, in the 1700s, this was owned by Colonel Pardon Gray. Uh, and if that name sounds familiar, they, you're probably thinking of the Pardon Gray Preserve, which is on Main Road in Tiverton. This, that was the, kind of the old uh, family property. That's where Pardon Gray is buried. But he actually lived uh, for most of his life. He lived down here in Little Compton. Um, he hired uh, Cuffey as a young man um, in, in loading uh, ship provisions and in a ironic twist. Some of these ships that Gray was having loaded were involved in the slave trade. Um, Tiverton, and to some extent Little Compton, had a, a lot of uh, slave ship captains and owners. They mostly sailed out of Newport. But uh, when you start looking at the, uh, at, at the number, it, it's quite surprising. So a guy like Gray was um, provisioning the ships. One of the main provisions would be rum. That's the commodity you would use to trade for the slaves, but you needed foodstuffs and what have you. Uh, so Cuffey uh, actually worked uh, um, loading ships. He was, a, this is, pr I think in the late, mid to late 1780s, Cuffey did that before he embarked on his own uh, commercial career, which he did fairly early. Uh, Probably, certainly by 1789, it looks like Cuffey has already established his, uh, his career, if you will, as an independent uh, shipper. Uh, as an uh, architectural aside, I would point out this house was built in 1690. This is along with the Wilbur House, which is basically across the road, <coughs> and the other Betty Alden House. There's two Betty Alden Houses in Little Compton, uh, all built in 1690. Three of the very oldest houses in this area. It is very rare to find any house in this area built before 1700. Uh, in this instance, the, <coughs> the uh, old part of the house, the oldest part of the house, is from the uh, doorway and to the right. So the doorway and the chimney, it started as an end chimney. You bring the doorway and the chimney. Pardon Gray added on the western uh, extension, <coughs> and the L was added also by Pardon Gray uh, about the same time, but certainly one of the oldest houses around. Uh, th this house isn't nearly in as good condition as the Betty Alden house. This is uh, the uh, the Joseph 
Soul House, this is on Drift Road in Westport. Um, this house in, in Cuffey's time was owned by uh, Lemuel Soul, who was Joseph Soul's son. And he sold a very small, about quarter acre uh, parcel to Cuffey down along the river, the, uh, the east branch, the west side of the east branch off Drift Road. And, uh, and uh, Cuffey had already, I'll, I'll cover in a minute, the, it was Cuffey's second purchase of these small, very small lots, about a quarter acre in size, uh, down along the river. Um, Lemuel Soule moved to New York. He moves. This house was owned for part of the time Cuffey lived in that Drift Road area. Uh, was owned by Humphrey Howland, who owned this property and then built the the stone house at the head of Westport. So it was quite a uh, quite a change in quarters for uh, Humphrey Howland. And then he, later on, he sold it to. Uh, uh, Luthan Tripp, <coughs> whose family uh, lived here for uh, for many years. This house is just to the north of the previous one. This house was built by uh, David Soule about 1790. Uh, this, uh, like the other, is on the west side of uh, Drift Road in Westport. David Soule's father, Isaac Soule, sold Cuffey his first piece of property on Drift Road, a tiny uh, quarter acre piece, which was the far southeast corner of the 66 acre Isaac Soule farm. David inherited part of that farm from his father, and he sold uh, a 3.5 acre parcel to Cuffey. Uh, before he moved, he moved to uh, New York as well. And as uh, people who deal in genealogy, these families know, I mean, uh, uh, people were moving right and left to New York, including some people of color, including uh, people who were related to Cuffey. And, uh, but it, as Lemuel Soul did, this guy, about probably half the people who would, if you grew up in a um, <clears throat> in place like Westport or Dartmouth, you'd end up moving away to, to uh, New York. Part of the reason, parenthetically, you know, my, my own, and take it for what it's worth, my own take is this. Some people will say, well, slavery, you know, died out because uh, rising sensibilities and uh, increase, increasing moral outrage. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what I think did in slavery. When slavery was instituted in this area, you had a situation where you had a lot of land and you didn't have enough people. So you did, there was a shortage of labor. Too much land, too few people. It makes sense, economic sense, put aside the morality of it, but just look upon it from economics. It makes sense to bring in additional labor to work the farm. So there was a market for slaves. And they had slaves right here in Dartmouth. They had slaves in Westport. Even more so, they had them over in places like Tiverton and Little Compton. But that situation changes. You know, by the 1740s, 1750s, the, the white people who are living here, if a guy has, you know, five sons, chances are three of them are going to have to move away. And most of them are going to move to New York to find land because the situation where there's not enough land and there's too much labor. And in that change situation, it no longer makes sense to perpetuate slavery because you're just adding labor where no labor is needed, where labor is already devalued. Um, and so I think that was part of the big underlying reason why uh, slavery, uh, slavery uh, declined uh, in this area. Um, as I said, David sold here, he sold, when I say the Paul Cuffey farm, it's really only a 4.25 uh, acre parcel that's on the opposite side of Drift Road from this property. Uh, whatever houses or structures were on that property uh, are no longer there. Uh, 
uh, at the symposium, I think we have a couple of pictures that were taken of uh, that will, will show the farm, but even, even, and those were taken about 1913 or so, but even on those pictures, I don't think those are the original structures, but that's a complicated uh, issue. Uh, but if you want to find out more, you can come to the symposium. This is uh, a house uh, at the, um, the head of Westport, Drift Road. You see the, the brick basement level of this house? That was used as a cabinet maker shop in the early 1800s by a man named William Mingo, who was a person of color of, of mixed um, African Indian ancestry who was, let me see, he would be the great nephew of Paul Cuffey. His grandmother was Paul Cuffey's sister, Ruth. William Mingo was also a sister, a brother of uh, New Bedford's Polly Johnson, who Polly and Nathan Johnson, who took in Frederick Douglass at their house on uh, 7th Street uh, in New Bedford in the 1840s. Um, by the way, the, the, the Mingos and, and the Cuffees, this, this intermixture of Indian heritage with African is something that happened from the earliest times in, in colonial New England. And uh, it's, it's so complete that even by 1800, I think you have a hard time finding anybody in, say, Westport or Dartmouth that you could point to and, and say is either of purely African ancestry or purely Indian. Uh, by that time, almost all the people who had come over as slaves had died. And the Indians were such, and I'm referring to something called the Earl Census, which was taken in 1861. It was a census of all Indians living in the state of Massachusetts by a guy named, uh, I think it was John Earl. And if you read his uh, report that accompanies that census, he says in there that he was convinced that there wasn't a single full-blooded Indian left living in the state of Massachusetts. Now, I, I don't know if that's true or not. That may be a bit of an overstatement, but I will say for around here, there's no question in my mind that uh, the overwhelming number of people of color were uh, mixed race, were mixed between African and Indian. And that continues to this day. I mean, I don't know, I, I used to think, well, boy, the Indians, they're all, they're disappeared. They really didn't, the Indians really didn't disappear, the Indians who lived around here. What happened is that they were assimilated with, uh, with people from Africa and with people from Cape Verde, and there's a lot of, there's probably hundreds of them today who are descended uh, have some line of descent through, through such people, and mostly living in places like New Bedford, but, uh, and mostly, I, I'm sure, unaware of their, of their ancestry, but I, I'm convinced that the, the Indian, the local Indian is alive and well. He's just not, uh, he's just not uh, residing, I guess, uh, exactly where we think he'd be. Next. This is the... Uh, the Paul Cuffey um, monument at the, uh, this is in front of the uh, Westport Friends Meeting House. Uh, those, this is date of birth, date of death, as I mentioned, the 200th anniversary of his date of death this year. Uh, Cuffey spelled here with two E's, Cuffey sometimes. Cuffey himself preferred to spell it always. He spelled it with one E. But some members of his family did spell it with two. Notice how what, what they've done in the Cuffey family, remember his father's name was Cuffey Slocum. They've taken the father's first name and used that as a last name. They have dispensed with the name Slocum. Now, why did they do that? I guess one, one theory is, and, and uh, 
that has been mentioned is that, well, the, the, the white slocums were upset that there were people of color walking around with the slocum name. But, you know, if they were really that bothered by that possibility, they should have thought of that before they had all those slaves, because probably no one around here owned more slaves than the slocums did. I don't think that's what happened, because there are many other people who appear in Dartmouth vital records who are people of color and go by the name of Slocum, including some of Paul Cuffey, by the, Paul Cuffey's sister, who lived, uh, Freelove, who lived until the year 1834. She went by the name Slocum until the end of her life. But in any event, uh, what, what Paul, the, the brothers, Paul, John, Jonathan, uh, they all, and David, they all ultimately used Cuffey as the last name. So in doing that, they've kind of preserved, in a way, their, their, uh, their African root. Because remember, Cuffey is Kofi, the Ashanti word for uh, born on Friday. Uh, Paul Cuffey, a, a patriot, uh, this was uh, the, oh, okay, uh, patriot, navigator, uh, educator. Uh, that's something to mention. Uh, Paul Cuffey, <clears throat> about 1797, now the details of this, I'll be honest with you, are a little hazy, more hazy than I would like, but I have been looking at that. He, he founded a, a school called Paul Cuffey School on Drift Road, and... Um, the story that has always been told goes something like this. Paul Cuffey wanted his children educated at Westport Public Schools. Westport says, no way, we're not going to do that. Cuffey says, okay, I'll open my own school and spend my own money. And he welcomed all children of the neighborhood regardless of color. And that this became the first... Uh, racially integrated school in the United States. Um, there's no question that there was a school in Cuffey's lifetime, which he refers to. He refers to when he's hiring a prospective teacher at one time. He's writing to his Wayner nephews about various aspects of ownership of the school. So there was a school exactly when it was founded um, and who attended it. Uh, it's hard to decipher. There's, there's very, very little in the way of actual contemporary records, aside from those few mentions uh, by Cuffey himself. But that is something that we should note. Philanthropists, <clears throat> among his acts of philanthropy, were uh, contributing over half the cost of building the meeting house, which we'll see in a minute. Friend meaning, uh, <clears throat> I guess, a twofold meaning, friend in the conversational sense, friend being a, a, a Quaker, and uh, a noble character. Next. This is the meeting house that uh, Cuffey contributed over half the cost of rebuilding in uh, 1816, I think it was. <clears throat> there had been a meeting house at this uh, location for about 100 years before that. And uh, they, <clears throat> they built this. Cuffey was instrumental in being on the uh, committee. And uh, <clears throat> now, uh, we've recently, uh, I've seen some indication. I always thought that they just tore down the old meeting, meeting house and built the new one on the same spot, much like they did with the Ponagansett uh, at the end of the 1700s. However, there's something in the Quaker records that indicate that the old meeting house stayed up and was used while they were building the new meeting house. And so I suspect that it, uh, it may, have been, uh, may have been just to the north here, and uh, I'll have to check further, and, but there's a possibility that they might still have a building there that would be the old meeting house. Uh, <clears throat> the, the burial ground for the Quaker meeting house is out uh, behind here. Cuffey was, to my knowledge, the only person of color, certainly, and I've been through all the records of births, marriages, deaths for the Westport Monthly Meeting, he is the only person of color that I see in there. However, his nephew, Gardner Wayner, was unquestionably a member of a Ponagansett 
monthly meeting because he obtained a removal certificate to move from Dartmouth to Scipio, which is in Cayuga County, New York. And in order to get a removal certificate, you had to be a Quaker uh, in good standing. Um, Paul Cuffey's brother, John, although I don't see him in the records, unquestionably considered himself a Quaker, just judged by his, um, his writings. Similarly, Paul Cuffey's uh, nephew, Thomas Wainer, also considered himself uh, a Quaker. Many of Paul Cuffey's family, however, I mean, most people, when you say Paul Cuffey, we immediately think Quaker, but a lot of his family members were actually members of the Old Stone Baptist Church in Adamsville. Cuffey's wife, Alice, his mother-in-law, Naomi Quantz, his sister, Fierce Slocum, his sister-in-law, Jane White Cuffey, who was John's, uh, John Cuffey's wife and a sister of Shalati White, as well as Shalati White was a member of, of the Old Stone Baptist. Paul Cuffey's uh, daughter, Mary Phelps, and his daughter, Rhoda Taylor, who I mentioned uh, before briefly being at the almshouse, Rhoda Taylor uh, was married at that church. So a number of uh, Cuffey's family were, uh, were actually associated with the Baptist church. The Baptist church in Ad Adamsville in those days had a, uh, it just seems to me, was much more receptive to people of color and Indians than some of the other churches. Uh, if you read uh, Peleg Burroughs' journal, which is, uh, Peleg Burroughs was a minister in the late 1800s at the Baptist Church. He, uh, he writes quite often about, uh, about uh, people of color. Uh, let me see. I just want to make sure. I'm... Okay, next. <clears throat> These are the gravestones of Paul Cuffey and Alice. These are located out behind the meeting house. Um, Paul Cuffey, we know from the Quaker records, contemporary Quaker records, was buried the day after he died. I don't think he would have had a, a gravestone at the time. These gravestones may be placed later. <coughs> you might say, why does that matter? <coughs> Maybe it doesn't matter anyway. But one of the things that strikes you when you first see these two gravestones is that they're quite a distance removed from the white Quakers. This is almost at the far north end of the lot, whereas the white Quakers are down. You see all the gravestones down towards the south end. And at first blush, this might appear to be some sort of a separate treatment or discrimination, but we, we kick that around, some of us. And I really doubt that's the case. Um, at the time Cuffey would have died in 1817, the next oldest gravestone in the cemetery is 1834, 17 years later. At the time Cuffey dies, they weren't using gravestones. They weren't even using field stones, it seems, for the most part. They were just putting people in the ground, much like they did at Aponagansett. Um, and that would, Aponagansett is kind of the parent meeting, if you will, of Westport, and uh, that seems to be the way they handled it. So I, th I think Cuffey is just, he, he is in a sense in the, uh, in the old, older part of the cemetery. The Quakers who were buried starting in the 1830s and moving onward were buried in the more uh, southerly part of the cemetery. I have it on pretty good information. Not, it doesn't relate directly to the Cuffeys. But some of those stones that are in the southern part of the cemetery were, were not placed on the actual burial sites of the people they commemorate because, frankly, they don't know where those people are buried. They're buried somewhere in the cemetery. And likewise, Cuffey, we, don't, we can't be sure if he was buried in this spot uh, or not, but um, 
Anyway, these stones probably date from a later time. This is uh, a nearby. The only stone that's nearby the Cuffies, this is uh, uh, Joseph C. Nicholson, um, who this is a great-grandson of uh, Paul Cuffey, who, uh, who chose to be uh, buried uh, near him in uh, the Quaker Cemetery. I'll mention for a minute Joseph Nicholson's grandfather, who's another, is, like I said, he's a great-grandson of Paul Cuffey and a grandson of Pardon, Captain Pardon Cook, who was Paul Cuffey's um, son-in-law. And Pardon Cook was um, a whaling captain. He lived down on Drift Road, a bit south of where um, Paul Cuffey lived, but not too far away. And um, I'm going to read to you an excerpt. This is from The Liberator. 1843, that's William Lloyd Garrison's abolitionist newspaper. They had profiles at certain, uh, in certain editions of, of people of color who they highlighted. And one of them was Pardon Cook, who's the grandfather of uh, Joseph Nicholson. He said, I had a very pleasant interview with Captain Pardon Cook, who married a daughter of Paul Cuffey. Captain Cook is the only colored man, so far as we know, who enjoys the distinction of commanding a whaleman. I'll, as an aside, I'll say that in 1843, we know that's uh, not the case. In fact, another one who was a, a, a whaler at that time was Pardon Cook's brother-in-law, who was a, a man named Captain Absalom Boston, who lived in Nant Nantucket. Uh, but putting that aside, Captain Cook is not obnoxious to the charge of his being indebted for his abilities to any white blood that he possesses, for few are darker than he. And it's a very elliptical way, as an aside again. Of, uh, of saying that, that, I guess people were snickering, saying, well, he's a good captain, but it must be because he's, he must have a lot of white blood in him. But uh, what the writer is expressing is that, by appearance, he doesn't seem to have very much uh, white blood. He has performed three voyages from Westport as master, and in every instance has succeeded in making good voyages, better than any other vessel from the same place, considering the amount of capital invested. In May 41, he sailed on the same day with a bark champion of 240 tons, both to cruise on the same ground. His brig, the Elizabeth, was only 107 tons and manned three boats. The outfit of the bark was about $15,000, whereas his own outfit was only about $5,000. Captain Cook returned in just one year with 290 barrels of oil. The bark was out about 16 months and brought just 340. It is easy to calculate which made the most money. He has invariably given satisfaction to owners and crew, has never been troubled with mutiny or other serious disorder among his men. Um, on the 22nd of June, Captain Cook sailed on his fourth voyage in the brig June of Westport, having one of his white neighbors as his mate. Hitherto, all voyages had been made in brigs. We presume a few more trials will so far convince the public of his ability and trustworthiness that he will be thought capable of managing a three-masted vessel. So it's kind of a Wall Street Journal, Forbes magazine account, a kind of inside baseball uh, in the whaling industry saying that, well, he's done a very good job. I guess that's how they used to compare it, saying, well, what was the return of, in terms of barrels of oil uh, given the size of the ship, the capital investment, the days out to sea, size of the crew, uh, et cetera. Next. Uh, over to the right, that's Rhoda Taylor. Uh, that's Paul Cuffey's youngest daughter. I mentioned her. She uh, ended up being at the uh, almshouse. And this is in the, the Potter's Field section of Beech Grove Cemetery in Westport, just over the stone wall a little ways from the Quaker Meeting House. Um, oh, she died 1878, later than I thought. Uh, Peter. Uh, that was her first husband on the, uh, is on the left, Reverend Peter Eason, possibly a relative of a woman who we will see in a, in a moment. And in the back is John H.W. Eason, one of her children. I think she had th three children in all, uh, all of whom uh, died um, 
died pretty young. She lived on the Paul Cuffey farm down on Drift Road. She was foreclosed upon by her sister, Alice Cook, who is Pardon Cook's wife, uh, in 1864. And so she was uh, lost her place there and went from there to the, uh, to the poor farm. Next. Uh, this is uh, Captain John Wainer uh, and his wife, Mary Easton Wainer. Uh, uh, John Wainer was uh, a nephew of Paul Cuffey. His mother was Paul Cuffey's sister. Mary, that's uh, David F. Uh, Wainer in the back, who's one of their, uh, one of their sons. John Wainer was himself a, um, a captain. Of a, he started out as a young man working for Paul Cuffey, and uh, like his brother Paul, was a, uh, uh, a sea captain, uh, both on whaling and um, commercial uh, voyages. Um, But I was going to mention mostly Mary, who's his wife. It was very interesting. Her family. Uh, she came from Bridgewater. where Her father, James Easton, was a freed slave of Peter Easton. And uh, he served in the American Revolution and played a notable role at the Battle of Fort Ticonderoga. And Easton, after the war, established a foundry business in Bridgewater. Uh, he worked on a bunch of notable construction projects. A lot of the ironwork for big construction projects in Boston was actually undertaken by his firm, uh, including the Tremont Street Temple and the Marine Railway. Uh, Easton, he purchased a pew in the Congregational Church in Bridgewater. That's what you did in the Congregational Churches. You had to buy the, buy the pews, only to find they came in one Sunday and the pew was coated with tar. And uh, after that, he uh, came in the next uh, uh, Sunday with his own pew that he had made, and he took up the offending one, put down his own pew, and they uh, sat uh, unmolested after that. Um, Mary's brother, Mary Easton's brother, Reverend Hosea Easton, was a prominent uh, minister, a writer, uh, an abolitionist. Uh, he published in 1837 a book called A Treatise on the Intellectual Character and Political Condition of the Colored People of the United States, uh, and that is which you can still get on Amazon, and uh, it's now generally considered the leading work articulating the abolitionist uh, position from an African American viewpoint. He's kind of the leading abolitionist in the pre-Frederick uh, Douglass uh, era, if you will. Uh, Mary's Easton's Wainer's brother-in-law was Benjamin Roberts um, of Boston. Uh, Roberts' father, Robert Roberts, was the first African American to publish a book. Um, that was it. Was called a. Um, he was a. Um, um, In 1827, he was a butler, and the book is called The Home Servant's Directory, a monitor for private families, uh, which is the first commercially published book by an African-American author. Um, and her, Mary's brother-in-law, Robert Roberts, uh, brought the first major uh, school desegregation lawsuit in the United States against the city of Boston in 1850, uh, which case was decided uh, uh, against him uh, when he brought it, his daughter, uh, he, he had attempted to enroll his daughter in the all-white Abiel Smith School in Boston instead of having to travel across town to an inferior colored school, which was designated by the city. And he was represented in that case by the future senator, Charles Sumner. And uh, the case was decided by uh, Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw, who was uh, Herman Melville's father-in-law, by the way. Uh, and uh, Shaw, 
created the doctrine that separate but equal facilities for minority school children did, uh, did not violate the Constitution. And later on, the United, decades later, the United States Supreme Court uh, adopted that rationale to decide Plessy versus Ferguson and uh, deny, uh, deny people of color the right to uh, integrated uh, education. Um, I, I read a little bit from the Liberator about Pardon Cook. Uh, uh, John Wehner also had, was written about in the same year in the Liberator. He says, on, on my way a few days since from Providence to New Bedford, I took occasion to turn aside to pay a passing visit to an aged and highly esteemed friend of mine living in Westport by the name of John Wehner, sometimes by way of distinction reluctantly called Captain, he having owned and commanded a small vessel for some years. I found Captain Wehner at home on his farm, which, by the way, is situated in the midst of a little colony of colored people on Westport Neck, a naturally sterile soil and most prolific in rocks and stones, but which, by unvaried assiduity and hard labor, such as all colored people have to adopt to obtain anything worth having, he and his noble family of boys, assisted by an excellent wife, have brought under a fine state of cultivation and which promises at no distant day to vie with the best farms in, in the town. Captain Wehner has had many difficulties to encounter from the spirit of prejudice, which has not let this uh, barren and almost isolated spot unvisited. His children were for a long time denied access to the district school on the same terms with the children of his white neighbors, but by unconquering adherence to principle and his rights as a citizen, he has at length obtained for his children an equal footing in the school, and they have well improved the opportunities thus offered. Um, Captain Wehner's nephew, Paul Cuffey, uh, on several of his voyages to Africa and Europe, Captain Wehner accompanied him as his mate, and he relates many thrilling adventures and incidents of those voyages which illustrate the shrewdness of Captain Cuffey in avoiding difficulties and in the management of his business affairs at sea and on shore. Uh, Captain Wehner relates an interesting account of a trip which he made a few years ago in Wilmington, North Carolina. He carried an assorted cargo for purposes of trade. The crew consisted wholly of colored men, his own neighbors. On their arrival at Wilmington, the greatest possible curiosity was manifested to know from whence they came. On being told that they were from Massachusetts, the inquisitive spectators who came down to see them were seized with astonishment. They saw no white man on board. They were asked if they followed the shore along to find their way, and many other simple questions. But being told they had pursued the ordinary track and came across lots and used the same means that others do to navigate, they were filled with wonder, and nothing would satisfy their incredulity but the exhibition of their logbook and a specimen of their daily reckoning. Such an example of profound learning on the part of colored people they seem never to have conceived of. And so impressed with the circumstance was one slaveholder that after examining all parts of the vessel with scrupulous care and asking questions enough to satisfy him that they really had been out of sight of land and found the shore again, that he declared his willingness to liberate all his slaves, as he was now satisfied that they were really men, possessed of like faculties with the white people. Um, next. This is... Um, Oh, before I take up this one, just one more thing about David Franklin Wehner, whose who's gravestone you saw in the back of the last photograph. He was a ship carpenter, lived on Drift Road. Uh, he died in uh, 1910, I think, or thereabouts. Dr. Burt from the head of Westport wrote on his death certificate, man of 85, 85, who persisted in working until he could no longer walk, then went to bed and died in 10 days. I am unable to find any evidence that any disease was the cause of death. Um, this guy here at the top, Jotham Tripp, is uh, my uh, third great-grandfather of mine. He lived on uh, Sodom Road. Uh, 
Um, in 1828, he was one of a mixed race crew of 19 men aboard the whaler uh, Protection, which was owned by the Wainer family, who were Cuffey's nephews by that time, and uh, commanded by Captain Paul Wainer, who was John's brother and um, nephew and namesake, probably, of uh, Paul Cuffey. Uh, the voyage returned with 500 barrels of whale oil worth $5,000. The, um, it was pretty common I at that time on these Wainer vessels to have uh, mixed race crews. So a lot of times you'd have you know white crewmen serving under um, black uh, or mixed race uh, captains, uh, which is probably about one of the few circumstances anywhere in the United States where you could uh, you could uh, you could find that happening. Next. This is uh, the Mariner's home in New Bedford, the house of, of William Roach, Jr. Roach was uh, instrumental in Cuffey's career. The, the most powerful uh, financier, uh, I think Cuffey's relationship with the family probably started through his Quaker activities and uh, through friendship with William Roach Sr. Roach Sr. retired from the business side of things very young, left it to William Jr. to handle the business and uh, concentrated on Quaker activities and uh, letter writing and, and, and such. William Jr. was the head of the American uh, branch of the Roach family enterprise, which was a vast enterprise, a multinational in, the era, in an era where there were hardly any true multinational concerns. The Roach enterprises were multinational. You had the whaling and, and all that in New Bedford and Nantucket, but you also had uh, other, fam other members of the Roach family, the extended Roach family, had uh, establishments over in Liverpool, in London, in Boulogne, in France, uh, in the Falkland Islands uh, for a time, uh, mostly connecting with whaling, but all, I mean whaling and, and commercial shipping. Um, Having a, a, a backer, you, you know, if, if, if put yourself in Cuffey's position. You're going to ship, which he did several times. He went to Liverpool, for example. Well, they're not going to know him from Adam over there. And remember, th this is, this is a, a, a time when he's bringing a cargo, which he may not be able to sell right away. He may just get... Uh, a, a warehouse receipt in exchange for. He may not get cash for it. But he has to buy uh, another cargo to bring somewhere else. Uh, it's very hard. You can, you can try to sell him the warehouse receipts, but it may not be easy. Um, and there's, there's almost no banks in those days. Banks are just about unknown. But if you have a letter of introduction from a guy like William Roach, Jr., who is a true multinational. It'd be like it'd be like if I came to do business with you today and I have like a letter of introduction from Warren Buffett saying, well, you know, Richard Gifford, yeah, he's, 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 no problem. He'll, he'll do great. And believe me, his credit's good. And if you have any problem with it, come see me. And this implicit backing of a guy like Cuffey was in, uh, from someone like Roach was invaluable in opening doors. And beyond just the commercial aspect, even in a kind of social aspect. Uh, being a Quaker was an advantage, business-wise, I think, in those days, because the Quakers liked to do business with other Quakers. And um, so if you're over in, in, Liverpool, in, in England, you know, in Liverpool or London, and uh, you can find some other Quakers. Um, probably be happy to do business with, among whom, by the way, the Quakers in England, <coughs> the Barclay family, as in Barclays Bank, which is still around, 
Well, the Barclays, the original Barclays who founded the bank are all Quakers. Um, so that, that probably, uh, probably wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to, to open some doors uh, there as well. Next. This is uh, uh, Captain Paul Cuffey Park uh, next to the Whaling Museum, uh, soon to be uh, relocated uh, to the other side of the Whaling Museum. This was placed, uh, I think, about 10 years or so ago by the uh, Whaling Museum. At this park, they have a, uh, uh, a representation. You can see a piece of it here at the lower left-hand corner of the, uh, uh, it's meant to represent the, um, <coughs> the compass that uh, Cuffey used on the Traveler. Uh, a ship that he used to make his, uh, his voyages to Sierra Leone. Cuffey went to uh, Sierra Leone in an effort to uh, colonize it, in, a, in, a, in effect, taking people of color who had lived in the United States to go over to Sierra Leone to establish uh, industries, to spread uh, Christianity. Uh, there's some, I suppose, to some extent, some disagreement or controversy about why uh, he did it. To me, the answer is, is pretty clear. His immediate, I think, um, objective was to better the lives of the people over in Africa. And as a more long-term uh, goal, I think, was by improving their economic condition to disrupt the cycle of slavery. Uh, you know, it, it, in order to have African slaves being imported into the United States, you needed Africans to be compliant in that. It was Africans who were capturing other Africans to start with, and then they were selling them to European and American traders. And if you can establish a, 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 a society that over in Africa that was prosperous, that engaged in industry, and um, taking advantage of the natural resources they had there. I think it was Cuffey's um, ultimate goal that this would, uh, this would disrupt slavery. I don't think he was at all despairing of the notion of people of color being unable to make it, if you will, in the, in over here in the United States. Certainly Cuffey himself would be a terrible example of that because Cuffey had uh, made it. When he died, he was a, uh, a pretty wealthy man by, uh, by the standards of the day. Next. This is the uh, Sundial Building. Uh, this was the site of a store in New Bedford named um, uh, Cuffey and Howard's. He went into this with two of his sons-in-law, Peter Howard and Alexander uh, Howard. They, um, they had a West Indies goods store. The, the Sundial Building, I think, was, was built, this was built about 1824, um, I think, uh, or thereabouts. Um, and so the Howards owned it, and then later another future Cuffey son-in-law, Richard Johnson, who we'll see more of in a minute, uh, he became a partner of the Howards. What did they sell? People have asked me, what did they sell in Paul Cuffey's store? Here's an 1814 advertisement. Um, uh, West Indies goods, and basically a grocery store. But they have Haisong, Suchong, and Bohia teas, sugar, coffee, rice, flour, raisins, nutmegs, cinnamon, allspice, pepper, ginger, cloves, butter, cheese, lard, codfish, onions, pearl ash, soaps, candles, starch, indigo, copperas, snuff, tobacco, American and Spanish cigars, cheroots, shaving soap, crockery, earthen and stoneware, needles, pins, fish hooks, and a variety of shoes. So it's kind of the, uh, the, the I guess, the Walmart uh, of its day. Um, and uh, they continued that to, 18, I think, to early 1820s when uh, Richard Johnson was the last owner of the business. Uh, the, the second house in, the house with the yellow uh, 
uh, on the uh, on the second floor. That was the site of the office of Dr. Juan Fernandez Bennett Drummond. Uh, she lived from 1864 to 1926. She was a great granddaughter of Paul Cuffey's son, William. Uh, Dr. Drummond uh, graduated from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1888. Back in then, they had separate medical schools for females. Uh, she established a practice in New Bedford. Uh, it's safe to say she was the first woman of color to be a medical doctor in the air, probably just the one, maybe the first woman, period, to be uh, a, a medical doctor who had uh, uh, graduated from, uh, uh, from medical school. Uh, this house, is, it's 90, 96, I think, 96, 95 or 96, South 6th Street. Uh, this house was built by uh, Richard Johnson, who was Paul Cuffey's son-in-law. He married uh, his daughter, Ruth. Um, he used this as a boarding house. Richard Johnson's house was behind this, you'll see the St. John the Baptist Church behind it. That's uh, County Street, runs parallel to the street. That's Wing Street down to the south. And Richard Johnson's house is probably, would have been in where the parking lot is now for St. John the Baptist. But he owned this as a, a boarding house. This is one of the few places in New Bedford that we can say uh, definitely was used as a stop on the Underground Railroad. And uh, it, it was useful for that purpose because normally, like I said, it would be used as a boarding house. People were moving in and out all the time. Very often there would be people of color working on the whaling ships. Uh, there was a, a big transient population, so uh, someone new coming in, uh, like a runaway slave, for example, would less likely uh, to be noticed. Uh, it was also the home for a time of Paul Cuffey Howard, who was a grandson of Paul Cuffey. Um, Paul Cuffey Howard was an abolitionist speaker. He, uh, there's one instance he gave, he gave a speech, uh, anti-slavery speech in the New Bedford Mercury, uh, printed an account of it that says, oh, this is a wonderful speech. Uh, Cuffey, uh, Howard held the audience uh, rapt attention for 45 minutes. Uh, uh, the people applauded and, and thought it was great. He says, oh, by the way, there was this other guy named Frederick Douglass who also spoke. Uh, this is, is Douglass's career was just starting. So it shows you Howard uh, Douglass was the <laughs> head and shoulders, the premier abolitionist orator of his day. So Paul C. Howard must have done pretty well on his own right. But he did something else, uh, which is noteworthy as well. Uh, we've all heard of uh, Rosa Parks. Uh, in 1955, uh, she refused to move to the back of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. But 113 years before Rosa Parks, there was Paul C. Howard. Uh, in 1842, he took uh, a seat in, they had a whites-only passenger car. This is on the New Bedford and Taunton Railway, which must have just been starting at the time. But, uh, and he was accosted by the conductor who told him that he had to go to the colored only uh, passenger car. There was a scuffle. He refused to move. Uh, he was charged with assault and battery on the conductor. He was held on a $700 bail, which in, in 1842 was an unbelievable amount of, of bail to hold someone on a uh, uh, A and B. And uh, <laughs> word spread, though, in the, in the community, in not, uh, not only the, uh, the community of color, but I think of the white people, too, white businessmen. And uh, that case quietly but quickly went away, never to be heard from again. And I've never seen any reference after that. Uh, it se certainly seems that they discontinued the practice of having segregated uh, transportation, segregated cars. But I've never heard, I've never seen any reference to it after that point. I was surprised to see that this happened because I had never seen any, I thought that segregated railway cars and things like that were things they only had in the south. But they did have them up here. Next. This is the uh, rural cemetery in 
in New Bedford. Um, there's several people in, in here that I'm going to talk about. The, uh, the first, first one, first gravestone on the left, that's Horatio Howard, great-grandson of Paul Cuffey. He was the guy who put the Paul Cuffey monument in front of the Friends Meeting House. He was a, um, a customs collector in New York, in Manhattan. In those days, that was a pretty good job to have. You could make some, some serious cash in a, in a job like that. Uh, that was a political plum. I'm not sure who we, you had to, you had to know somebody <laughs> to get a job like that in, in those days. I'm not sure who he knew exactly. Uh, the second from the right is his mother. That's Helen Louisa Gibson, married Shadrach Howard. That's his father. And the woman on the right is Betsy Gibson. That would be Horatio's maternal grandmother. Uh, Betsy Gibson is an interesting story. She was a slave in Georgia, and she became the uh, concubine, the lover of the white uh, slave master of the plantation, and by him bore uh, two daughters, one of whom was, was Helen. Um, the slave master acknowledged the, the, the two daughters as, as having some special responsibility for, and he arranged to have them, accompanied by their mother, go to New Bedford to obtain an education. It would have been illegal even to teach them how to read and write in Georgia at the time because they were slaves in the eyes of the law. So they came to New Bedford, and while they were here, the slave master sickened and died. The estate uh, tried to get the mother and two daughters to go back to Georgia. And they were, uh, they managed to convince them to do so, and they were on their way to doing so, virtually setting foot on the ship that would have brought them there when they were uh, accosted by people who knew better at the last minute and said, you know, don't do that. You're just, they're, they're going to put you back into slavery. And so they stayed in New Bedford, I think, quite wisely. And uh, and uh, and lived, uh, relatively speaking, probably happy ever after. The obelisk in the back, that's Shadrach Howard. That's, uh, that's the um, father of Horatio, the wife of Helen. Uh, Shadrach is a uh, grandson of Paul Cuffey um, and... Uh, uh, stepson. He's, he's, I mentioned Paul C. Howard. Shadrach is Paul C. Howard's brother. So he is a, uh, they, are, they are also stepsons of Richard Johnson, who we'll see again in a minute. Well, I mentioned Richard Johnson was the guy who owned um, the boarding house. Uh, Shadrach was a, a 49er. He went to California. Uh, and most people who went to California as 49ers made the mistake of looking for gold. And very few of them made any money. The guys who made the money going to California are people who sold things to the people digging for gold. And Shadrach was one of those. He developed hydraulic equipment, which was used by these gold miners. They were engaged in sluice mining. So there was a lot of need for water power and, and hydraulic hoses and equipment. And he made quite a bit of money uh, working there, and his family stayed in New Bedford, but periodically he would come back and forth. But on one of those trips, remember this is the days before the Panama Canal, and he was in uh, Cologne, Panama. What they used to do is they, they'd take a boat down, let's say, the West Coast, if you're coming back here, down to around where the canal is today, and then travel overland over the isthmus and pick up another ship on the other side. The only alternative was to go all the way around the Horn which is a pretty rough voyage and a much longer voyage. Uh, the problem with going through Panama over land, as, as he did, though, was that it was a very disease-ridden place. And one of these tropical diseases, he, um, Shadrach Howard, uh, uh, caught, and so he died there. But his, his uh, obelisk is, uh, is placed up here. Next. Ah, here's a close-up of Shadrach's um, 
the base of Shabrak's obelisk uh, grandson of Paul Cuffey. A number of these people who are grandsons, great-grandchildren of, of Paul Cuffey, they put it on their gravestones. They're, they're related to Cuffey. They already, even back in the 1800s, they knew that, you know, this is some, our association with someone like Cuffey uh, is something to be proud of. And it says here, on his journey from California to his native home in 1873 uh, in Cologne, Aspinwall, U.S. of Col Panama was part of Colombia at the time. I'm not, I'm not sure what the Aspinwall reference is. Um, contracted the fatal fever and died. Uh, his remains were uh, interred uh, in uh, Cologne. Next. Uh, the guy on the right is, not, is another. He's actually descent. This is in the same plot of uh, cemetery plot as the ones we've just seen. It's right next to the Howards. But uh, he, is a, he is an interesting guy, Edwin Bush Jordan. He is descended, I think he's a great-grandson, of Paul Cuffey's brother, uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Edwin Bush Jordan was a, uh, a lawyer in New Bedford. And in the late 1800s, he was, um, was good friends with two men named William Trotter and... W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, you may have heard of them. They were uh, uh, civil rights leaders, Du Bois mainly in New York, Trotter based in Boston. They would often meet at Jordan's house in New Bedford to discuss this uh, civil rights movement, which was just kind of getting started uh, at the time. They were founders of something called the Niagara Movement, a group of about 40 people which uh, led to the formation of the NAACP um, in the, I think about 1905, 1910, something like that. Um, <clears throat> Jordan's son, Edwin Bush Jordan Jr., while an undergraduate at Harvard, uh, led the fight to desegregate Harvard's dormitories, which had been segregated up until that time and who later moved to Evanston, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, and uh, held political office out there, and uh, was friends with, uh, among other people, Clarence Darrow and uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Jr. Uh, this is uh, our last slide. This is Ruth Cuffey. That's Paul's... Uh, Paul's daughter, she married uh, Richard Johnson. Uh, this was her second husband. Her first husband was Alexander Howard. So she was the mother of Shadrach and uh, Paul C. Howard, who I've already mentioned. Um, She had another son, another brother, who was of some note, too, a man named Alexander Howard, Jr., who didn't live around here. But he moved out to Olympia, Washington. And um, he and his wife established a, a hotel up there, which gained uh, quite uh, notoriety for its food, and which uh, I think President Rutherford B. Hayes and... Um, some other kind of celebrity, Ulysses Grant, and some other kind of celebrities of that era uh, uh, stayed at. Um, Richard Johnson was, when he died, they, di they died within minutes of each other. Uh, Richard Johnson, probably the wealthiest person of color in the United States, um, when he died, in the 1850 census, which is a census where the real estate value is listed, <laughs> his, his real estate is valued at $19,000, which, uh, which doesn't sound like much. I mean, uh, the, but remember, that's it's 1850. $19,000, though, was higher than any white man in Westport, Nantucket, and Little Compton. I can't say for sure of Dartmouth, but I wouldn't be surprised. It's, it's higher than just about any, maybe the, some of the Howlands down at Round Hill had something that was, was in, that, in that neighborhood. But uh, there wouldn't be, yeah, it probably did, especially with the salt works. But um, 
he, he, was, he was a very wealthy man. He made his money partly through uh, whaling um, and a lot of real estate. The New Bedford real estate appreciated tremendously uh, during his lifetime, and he kind of uh, rode the wave on that. One of the ships he owned was called the Rising States. Uh, and the captain, that was a, a, a commercial ship. It wasn't a whaler, but it was, a, uh, they shipped cargoes on it. But the captain of that ship was William Cuffey, who was Ruth's, uh, Ruth's brother. And uh, it encountered a storm in the South Atlantic, and uh, William Cuffey uh, died uh, in, in battling uh, 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 that storm. Uh, there were quite a few people, as an aside, in the uh, extended Cuffey family. I mean, you know, be ha living a life at sea has its, uh, has its perils for sure. And like I said, William, Paul's son, died in a storm at sea. He had a nephew, Jeremiah Wainer, who died uh, he also battling a storm while he was in command of the Cuffey ship uh, Ranger. Um, after Cuffey died, his son-in-law, Alvin Phelps, who lived next to him on Drift Road in Westport, commanded uh, a coastal ship called the uh, Hammer, which on a voyage of to Nantucket struck a reef uh, near Chatham and went down, and he and two of his sons, so two of Paul Cuffey's grandchildren, uh, died uh, in the wreck. Uh, so it's a very, uh, uh, part of having this life connected with the sea makes it a very hazardous um, uh, occupation. Um, nonetheless, uh, it's, it's an outstanding family. And as I've illustrated, um, you know, the, the connections of the Cuffey family to... Um, to various issues of civil rights. In a way, they're continuing that same legacy that Paul Cuffey, when he started writing about getting the right to vote back in 1780, um, was continued by uh, his grandchildren, by Ruth. Ruth, was uh, she signed an anti-slavery petition in 1837, I think it was signed by about 100 people. Her name was at the very, uh, the very top. Her husband, Richard Johnson, he was also, he was an abolitionist, but he's someone who kept very much in the background. He, he was kind of like William Roach Jr. He was the William Roach Jr. of the, of the black community. He was, a, he was an escaped slave himself, and he, he kept very much in the background. He did things quietly. He didn't make a lot of uh, public speeches or anything like that, but was kind of uh, quietly effective, and certainly quietly effective, just as Roach was, at, uh, at making money. Anyway, all in all, a, uh, I think a most uh, remarkable family, uh, and I hope some of you will consider coming and seeing our presentation at the Cuffey Symposium, which will be coming up in September of this year, commemorating the 200th anniversary of the death of Captain Paul Cuffey. Thanks for listening.